let's look around at some other kinds of insights that uh, people have shared. Uh, I, I guess so. Uh, I, I, I have, uh, you know, there's really, you know, the colors of the mind, uh, there's a, you know, we've been looking at pictures of rainbows in some of the previous uh, discussions. I mean, there's a very broad spectrum of experience on the human experience and even on the spiritual journey. People can feel uh, under tremendous pressure and strife and tremendous crisis. There can be tremendous experience of darkness within the unconscious as people proceed towards the light of their realization and, and that those dark times can be uh, analyzed and interpreted, particularly again in the world of forensics where we want to understand criminal behavior and what motivates people to do the things that they do and sometimes the terrible things that they do. In Wichita, Kansas, uh, the BTK killer used to keep the population uh, in, uh, under a form of terror. He was a notorious serial killer, particularly active in the 1970s. And he used to taunt the police and the local journalists, uh, the TV news, with uh, letters saying you'll never catch me, while describing at the same time, describing facts of the crimes that were known to the police and only to the police. Because of course, when these uh, events are disclosed, the police will, will not share all the information in order to try to minimize the number of fraudulent claims about uh, when people say that I, I'm the guilty one. So the known BTK killer uh, wrote letters and uh, there was special information in those letters that I used to identify uh, Dennis Rader as the BTK killer. In fact, I, I ID him on Wichita Radio 15 minutes before he confessed. So I, I beat the presses with my analysis. He was, already, he was already being held under suspicion at the time, but I was able to ID him in a special way. Let's listen to Rader's forward statements. He's talking about preparing for a court hearing where he'll be appearing before a judge. So now that party, we got the Tesco case subpoenaed in, or Tesco been subpoenaed in, we cannot talk to that party. We can't, they can't take care of the business. When I played that clip backwards, I could hear Rader say the words, the demons influence that guy. They need the sequence now. They need the sequence now. They need the sequence now. They need the what was that special piece of information that was shared in those letters from BTK, shared with police and, and the press, that instructed me that Raider was in fact the BTK killer? It, it was that BTK claimed to be possessed by a demon. This was his statement. And when I saw the uh, synchronicity, and the fact that Raider was talking about demons unconsciously, in the, in, the, in the context that I had used this procedure successfully to anticipate world events as well as in my clinical practice and had repeated verifications about the truth of the statements. I said, you know, people don't usually talk about demons. It's unusual. But here's a person talking about demons and, and here's the BTK killer, the known killer talking about them. What are the chances? It's, it's very likely that Raider is in fact the killer. Well, Raider confessed 15 minutes after I put that story to air in Wichita and he... Um, Two weeks later, appeared before the cameras again. I'm just uh, trying to do this quickly. I want to get to this, his uh, remarks where he verifies his statements. There we go. This is Raider's comments two weeks later. And this is the speaker himself. As, it, as happens in so many cases, the speaker himself is verifying the contents of his own unconscious messages. I just want to start to say me. of intelligence 
and present it to them for their feedback. It's for their subject to their uh, interpretation. But at time and time again, the information is verified. And I really think that that, you know, agree or disagree that uh, people are speaking backwards. The fact is that statistically, I don't think it's very likely, just based on, on average performance, that a person could, could accumulate so much penetrating information to define not only the arrow of time, but in fact, uh, you know, the national security apparatus, the people's egos, people's pride, people's vanity, their willingness to disclose or not disclose. You know, many talk therapies uh, are subject to those kinds of inhibitions. People don't want to talk about the things that are painful. They don't want to be seen in a bad light. People are afraid that, that their reputations might be at stake. But the unconscious is willing to disclose, and if we are willing to engage the unconscious, the unconscious will tell us a story and share information about the person's inner condition and, and begin to point the way to a roadmap for wellness in, in that process of self-discovery. So in fact, we find that people experience catharsis within 60 to 90 minutes when we use this procedure. And it's not only because of the information, but maybe some of you have noticed, tell me, when you heard these clips, the backwards speech clips, the mirrored audio, did any of you feel any sensations? Yeah. Did you feel goosebumps? Yeah. Or hair raising? Or spine tingling? Your nervous system is sensitive to sound. And these are special sounds that are, are speaking to the core of your anatomy that is sensitive to sound information. And we'll see that in uh, traditions, mystical and spiritual traditions such as yoga, the knowledge of the inner mind, the unconscious sensitivity to sound is well established and has been scientifically developed over thousands of years. This plays into that. This is part of the appeal to me in this subject for someone who had a deep and rich background in yoga and meditation, and mantra meditation, and the science of sound. This science of sound, this 20th, 21st century science of sound, brought access to the potential, you know, liberating potential of sound within the individual and its applications in the clinical work lead to catharsis within 60 to 90 minutes. That's penetrating and powerful insight for anybody and a very useful resource. And so I felt tremendously inspired to study this, not only because I wanted to understand the mysteries of the UFOs or the mysteries of foreign policy, I, I wanted to know more and more about human potential for growth, development, and healing through the use of sound. So what we'll do is we'll take a little break from, uh, from playing back clips, and we'll go to my visual library, and in the course of developing, in the course of developing my speech research and the ups and downs, and as you might imagine, the, you know, the uh, the blowback and feedback that I encountered from disclosing so much information in public over so many years, um, I, I ended up here more than one time at the East City Ranch uh, and was inspired by the photography that was produced here on an ongoing basis. And so my own photography began to grow. But my application was to, to uh, create photo documentation of processes uh, doing mantra meditation. So while reciting mantras, while performing bhajan or kirtan in Sanskrit or Bengali, I was producing photography. And so there's a, there's a really interesting relationship between those photographs, and we're going to see that, and this mirrored sound phenomena. It says that, that the mirrored effect is really inherent to, to human speech, not only audibly, as we were just listening to, but visually as well. Mm 